since our last video, when we were looking at uh, Lincoln Beachy and Barney Oldfield and the races they had together, the question came up, did either one of these ever die in a crash? Well, let's take Beachy first. There's two things I want to share about Beachy. One happened the same year he was in Port Huron. The other happened a year after he was in Port Huron. In 1914, Russia had over a thousand military aircraft at their disposal. Germany also had a thousand. France also had a thousand. The United States had 23. One of the most lasting impacts Lincoln Beachy had on American aviation history was his promotion of a stronger Air Force. Lincoln used his plane to distribute millions of brochures all over the country, encouraging people to vote for military investment in an Air Force. Lincoln invited a group of government officials to an air show where he would demonstrate how powerful an ally an Air Force would be to the military but only two cabinet members appeared for the demonstration. Frustrated with the stubborn blindness of the government, Lincoln planned for another surprise White House visit, this time in the form of an aerial attack. The buzz of Lincoln's biplane grew louder and louder as he approached the White House, where President Woodrow Wilson was reportedly working in his office. By the time President Wilson was concerned enough by the sound to look out the window, the plane was mere seconds away from impact. In his typical flourishing style, Lincoln tore upwards at the very last second and continued to dive bomb the White House and other government buildings on Capitol Hill. Frightened citizens and congressmen poured from the buildings to see what was causing the commotion, and a small amount of chaos spread through the streets as most people were temporarily under the impression they were truly under attack. By the time Lincoln had gathered the attention of nearly everyone in Washington, he landed and announced, If I had had a bomb, you would be dead. You were defenseless. It is time to put a force in the air. The stage attack appears to have had the intended effect, and Congress voted to increase military spending. Lincoln remained a vocal supporter throughout his career, continuing with military propaganda events despite turning down a powerful position offered to him by the government. The second thing I want to share with you is that just seven months after Beachy gave his exhibition here in Port Huron, he was in San Francisco. A crowd of 50,000 gathered in the fairgrounds to watch Lincoln Beachy's spectacular flying stunts, with another 200,000 spectators packed in the surrounding hills for a free viewing. This event would unveil Lincoln's latest and most powerful plane yet, the Beachy Eaton monoplane, capable of flying over 100 miles an hour. The event began successfully, with Lincoln guiding the monoplane high over the Alcatraz Island at San Francisco Bay, completing a loop-the-loop -loop or two to get the crowd going. Amongst the deafening cheers of the onlooker, Lincoln turned the plane onto its back, in possible preparation for an inverse loop just 3,000 feet over the water. The plane began to sink in the air, and Lincoln attempted to salvage the situation by turning the plane 180 degrees onto its belly. But the strain of the maneuver cracked the rear spars, and the force of the air against the wings of the monoplane cracked it down the middle with a bone-rattling sound, allowing the wind to rip the wings completely from the body of the plane. Now locked in a nosedive from which he could not escape, Lincoln and his mangled monoplane crashed against the surface of the bay, quickly sinking into the freezing water. It would take rescuers nearly two hours to find the body of Lincoln, still strapped tightly to the monoplane, which was discovered close to the shore of the bay, bringing him back to where his fatal love of flying began. With a dark irony only life can convey, Lincoln and his monoplane were recovered by the USS Oregon, the battleship Lincoln pretended to destroy. The autopsy reports show that Lincoln survived the impact with only a broken leg, but drowned when he was unable to free himself from the restraints that were supposed to save him. The public was so devastated by the shocking death of Lincoln Beachy that phone calls in and out of the city 
jammed the phone lines for an entire 24 hours. Lincoln, the first of his kind, a familiar hometown figure with a powerful love of his country and a natural born showman, had been taken from his loving audience far too soon at the tragically young age of 28. Though he turned down an offer for a career in the Air Force he helped grow, he died as one of the highest ranking members in the Volunteer Aviation Reserve and was remembered fondly by a member of the organization who said, it was his unlimited courage, more than anything, that enabled Beachy to live as long as he did. I can't help but think what Beachy's last thoughts might have been before he hit that water. He always thought a secret thought behind the audience when they came to see him, was they wanted to see him die. And they finally got their wish. Ernie Oldfield's death wasn't near so dramatic. He died of natural causes. After he left Port Jern, uh, well, it'd be about uh, two years, three years after he left Fort Yarn, he debuted his new race car, the Golden Submarine. The Golden Submarine was an early 20th century streamlined race car designed and built in 1917 for Varney Oldfield. The Golden Submarine was designed with a roll bar to protect the driver. Varney Oldfield beat fellow racing legend Ralph De Palma in a series of 10 to 25 mile match races at Milwaukee winning all three. He retired from racing in 1918, but continued to tour and make movies. And what was his last attempt at racing in 1932? He tried to re-enter speed racing with a new car design, but was unable to find any financial sponsors. His happiest days were behind him now. He promoted Firestone Tires for a while, but he drank too much and the job was gently taken away from him. He lost all his money in the stock market, went through a succession of stormy marriages, and ironically spent some time giving lectures on auto safety for the Plymouth Motor Corporation. Barney Oldfield died in 1946 of a cerebral hemorrhage. It was not the end he would have chosen. If I go, he had once said, I want to be in a Blitz and Benz, or a faster car if they ever build one. With my foot holding the throttle wide open, I want the grandstand to be crowded and the band playing the latest ray. I want them all to say as they filed out the gate, well, old Barney, he was going some. Well, that brings us to the third major event that was at the driving park. And that's when the Patterson Flyers came to town. The year was 1915 when this ad appeared in the paper. Port Huron gets the best there is every year. Last year, Lincoln Beachy and Barney Oldfield. This year, the celebrated Patterson Aviators. Port Huron has booked aeroplane flights August 7th and 8th at the Port Huron Driving Park. The Patterson Aviators were a group of pilots that were based in Detroit. This would have been the first time in Port Huron that more than one plane was in the air at a time. July 31st, 1915 has appeared in the Times Herald. Patterson Aviators give battle in air, same as is done in war zones. To give the Port Huron residents an idea of what was to come, they had just been in Fenton, Michigan and put on a show. The Fenton correspondence gives the following account of the flights there. Heralded by salvos of exploding bombshells, the 100 horsepower OEW aeroplane, piloted by Aviator Williams, buzzed away past overhead at over 70 miles an hour. At once, aviator Albert Boschek and a similar 60 horsepower biplane arose to repel the attack. As it was, the terrific disturbances in the air caused by explosions all about the machine made it flutter helplessly like a leaf in the wind. Several times, Boschek was apparently doomed, but with the utmost skill, he succeeded in righting himself, as to the great relief of the spectators. As he was unable to slip past the other machine to assail it from above, he commenced a revolver attack. One of the shots must have struck home. For an instant later, to the horror of the onlookers, a figure seated beside Williams fell headlong out of the machine and with swaying arms and legs, hurled down 400 feet until it jammed into a plowed field. It was a certain later that the figure was a dummy. Shells of horror ran over the crowd while some of the photographers were so fascinated or paralyzed 
their fingers stiffen and refuse to work. Miraculously, as seen, the two machines escape collision by a hair breadth. There is no mistaking the intense relief of the people on the ground as each turned and looked into his neighbor's face. It would seem that the folks in Port Huron were going to be treated to something uh, additional uh, than Fenton saw, a patriotic program. July 29, 1915, this appeared in the Times Herald, patriotic program to be featured of aeroplane flights next month. The article states this, this is everywhere acclaimed the most beautiful aeroplane demonstration ever presented. It is a daylight feature with much the same effects on the crowds of spectators as the most gorgeous night fireworks. It is a rare spectacle, an aeroplane away aloft in the blue, flags all over it, streamers of the national colors waving away behind in the wind. Suddenly a roll of bunting drops out, then another, weighted down the unroll, till the whole forty feet of colors stand out against the sky, and they flutter straight down hundreds of feet to the ground. That invariably brings peals of the most thunderous cheering ever heard. And before it has died away, cages of doves are released from cages on the flying aeroplane. Half stunned, they drop like a shot, then quickly recover and take wing. Two flocks of them. And to cap the climax, the aviator fills the air with souvenir cards or blossoms for the crowds below. Choruses of admiring oohs and ahs from the children and ladies, old and young, accompany the delightful features of the exhibition, while the sterner spectators evince their enthusiasm more vigorously. The Patterson aviators have designated O.E. Williams to make the aeroplane flights at the big Fort Huron celebration. He is one of the most noted of these expert flyers and had been selected to take a leading part in the spectacular aeroplane battle which they are to give at the Michigan State Fair this fall. It would also seem that this would be the first time in Port Huron that the aviators would be given spectator airplane rides. Want to ride in an aeroplane? Your opportunity will come on August 7th and 8th during Big Aviation Meet. This article also appeared in the Times Herald. Want to take a ride in the clouds? Aviator Williams is anxious to have a woman take views of the city. Is there any woman in Port Huron or at the beaches who would like to ride up in the clouds on a snapshotting trip? Williams, a famous Patterson aviator to fly here on the 7th and 8th, wants to add aeroplane views of a beautiful Port Huron to his large collection. As a result of his very experiences with photographers, he believes almost any cool-headed woman Kodaker is a way ahead of the best men photographers when it comes to getting beautiful pictures from an aeroplane where instant decision and action are required. He claimed by the time a man picks out a choice bit of scenery and gets ready to snap the machine, he is far beyond it, going as he does at over a mile a minute. As amazing as all these things were to see, this is not the third event I want to share with you. The third event was this. Port Huron would be the first city in the state of Michigan to have air mail. Patterson Aviator to carry mail for Port Huron people. Port Huron citizens and visitors have the first opportunity ever afforded in Michigan to send souvenir cards by aeroplane mail. Arrangements are being made so that all occupants of the grandstand seats at the driving park on Saturday, August 7th and 8th can deposit two picture postals, each for transmission by the Sky Route. All cards will be properly addressed with one cent stamps. They will be collected at the grandstand and delivered to the postmaster of the city. Postmaster Whitliff, under special authority from Washington, will swear in the aviator as a United States aerial mail carrier and take him in his aeroplane under full protection of the United States postal laws so that any interference with him in the performance of his duty will be a criminal offense. The mail will be carried via aeroplane thousands of feet up among the fleecy clouds on his route and will then be delivered to other employees of Uncle Sam who will cancel it with a special stamp. Michigan First Aeroplane Mail, Fort Yarn, August 7th and 8th, 1915. Here's another piece of mail that was uh, mailed one of those two days. 
It looks like one of the uh, postal cars that uh, they sold there at the park. You can see a picture of the plane as well as a stamp. The transaction for the postal cards and the stamps took place in the grandstands. The postal cards were free as long as they last, but you had to buy the stamps. And I think they had something set up like a booth. Uh, this photograph here is a booth in another city where this transpired as well. So I would imagine it was very similar to this. The mail would have been put in a leather bag, secured at the top, and given to the pilot. The pilot would have taken off from the driving park and flown the plane from uh, the driving park over to the post office, which at that time was on Water Street and uh, it later became the federal building. He would have flown low and probably tried to drop the uh, bag on the lawn so it would be a softer landing, but there's not much lawn in this picture as you can see. And then the postal people would come out and pick it up and take it in there for sorting. On Monday, August 9, 1915, this article appeared in the Times Herald. Aeroplane made three flights. Sunday crowd witnessed a performance of Aviator Williams at Driving Park. The first aeroplane mail service in Michigan was the outstanding feature of Aviator Williams' flight at the Patterson Brothers exhibition at the Driving Park yesterday. Saturday afternoon exhibition was postponed owing to the poor quality of gasoline furnished the aviator and which necessitated Mr. Williams going to Sarnia to the plant of Imperial Oil Works to get gasoline of sufficient proof to drive the powerful motor of the aeroplane. Those who attended Saturday afternoon were given back their admission money at the gates and returned again Sunday. In the meantime, everyone was purchasing postcards and stamps to be sent via the first aeroplane service for Michigan. This was a feature of the day, and in no time at all, the available supply of postcards and stamps were sold out. Today, we look at this rickety old plane and wonder how they did it. Can you imagine the folks back then, if they were able to see how the mail was delivered through the air today? They would just knock their socks off. But I guess it knocked their socks off back then as well. But in Michigan, it all started at the Port Huron Driving Park. I hope you've enjoyed our series on the Driving Park. I know I have. Join me in our next video and we'll see what there is to see.